Thank you for joining us today for our conversation with Joe Caruso. Our host is Joe Caruso. Hi. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, thanks for everybody's comments and suggestions. We love them. Uh, today, I'm so excited. I'm, I, I got to say, I'm very happy to talk to everybody I've talked to, but this guy's uh, probably going to be more interesting than almost anybody I've had ever. His name is Daniel Marcos, and I'm going to let Daniel tell you about him rather than me paraphrase it uh, in a failing way. Daniel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. You're such a gentleman. Thank you very much. <laughs> How are yeah, you? There you are. Now, I have to tell everybody, and I hope I always ask, what can I disclose? What do you want to keep private? You're about to move. So you had bookcases behind you your entire life. What's going on? I had a professional microphone and lighting and all the set. Everything yeah. is on its way to Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm in Toronto in a plastic table. There's nothing in my house. Um, so I'm going to a hotel tomorrow, by the way, for a week or so. A week? The thing is, we have to sell the house and then wait until we get paid before we get into the, the U.S. Yeah, if yeah, not, yeah. the U.S. will tax us on the wholesale of the house. Exactly. So we have okay. to stay for a week until all the transaction goes through. All right. So one of the questions, first questions I asked every client when they call every week, my clients call every week, and we talk for an hour. And the, the thing I say is, how is your mind today? So I think this is a beautiful timing in your life. Uh, and I know because we've talked once before, you're pretty honest about uh, how you experience your life and you're good at expressing it. Uh, comment to YPO, by the way, uh, Young Presidents Organization, for those who don't know. Um, when I say, how is your mind today? Most people are physically oriented and they think about, oh, I'm a little sluggish, I'm a little slow, I need a cup of coffee. Yeah, but athletes know, mm, today I, uh, I don't have it. Uh, today I have it, push it. But experts in the mind know Today, my mind is strong. So I woke up last night, three o'clock in the morning. I was writing for the new book. And I thought, mm, then I, maybe I'll be tired tomorrow. I woke up this morning, totally on fire. My mind was incredibly strong. And I know that. And I know that's the time a writer writes. And so write when your mind is strong. Uh, so we know that there's major stressors in life. One of them is, believe it or not, speaking in public, one of them is moving. They're moving. But, but moving, it's a great experience. You're, you're looking forward to a big change in life, all these new things. Yeah. So that's great. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, okay. But let me, let me tell you what I, my, my you, is a great state to me. I just want to establish the marriage. Uh, so your wife and you are moving. My wife, yes. Yeah, you're not, okay. And, yes. and uh, before you get to the next thing, could you please just tell everybody what you do uh, a little bit, and then I want to get, okay, I want to know who you are before we. Uh, 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 entrepreneur, uh, 23 years now, uh, building and running my companies, uh, originally from Mexico, have lived in uh, the U.S. for 15 years or so. Uh, in Austin, Texas, came to Toronto uh, three years ago, and now we're going back uh, to Austin. Um, I have a company called Growth Institute, where we help mid-market companies be able to scale faster and reduce the drama on their operations. Uh, I know how much drama it creates to be an entrepreneur, and I want to help fellow entrepreneurs have less drama. No drama, it's impossible when you're scaling a company, but at least less drama, and for them to be able to enjoy uh, life a little bit more. Um, and one example of that is an example of today. Um, so today, today and tomorrow morning, I'm taking a program at Harvard. I, I got three O into this program at Harvard, and I I didn't sleep that much because I was until late reading all my cases to get ready for class today. 
Um, but I feel super young because I'm reading all these classes and being in an environment uh, of university and having this discussion with Harvard professors has been a lot of fun. I have really not worked uh, for my business today. My team, I have a, a really, really, really amazing team and they're running day to day. Things are perfect. There's been no issues. Indeed, tomorrow we have a webinar with Jack Stack from the Great Yellow Business. Uh, we're launching a new class with Jack. We're going to have around a thousand people on a, on a webinar tomorrow. I'm, I'm studying in Harvard, having this conversation with you, getting worried about the move and stuff like that. And my team is running the company. So I'm really happy. And that keeps me excited and happy. Uh, I've been learning, I've been growing, and my company is moving along. So that's good. There are different motivators in life. Some people want to burrow into what they know, a quite provincial lifestyle. That's why PE companies, private equity companies, buy small businesses because they're so provincial and they know if it's a good product, a good idea, that they're not optimizing it. Uh, the mind works that way, which is what my area of expertise is. Uh, you get excited by growth. and yes. So someone was asking me last week, who are your clients? And I said, someone who has the desire to invest in their mind and capacity to find out how their mind is in their own way and how they're not just doing mental masturbation. I don't know if I could say that as a broadcast or not. Mental masturbation is basically making yourself feel good about something, but nothing's happening. You're not doing anything. You're just making. It's the people that carry the right title on the airplane so other people can see them carrying the book that makes them look smart versus the person that actually learns from the damn book. And, and, uh, and those are the people I seek out. It sounds like it's the same client that, well, it seems like that's who you are. That's my impression, which is why I'm attracted to you in that way. And it seems like those are the clients you seek out. So, so um, I've been part of this group called Gathering of Titans. Um, uh, I don't know if you- Lower so we can all hear it. Yeah, it's called Gathering of Titans. Um, okay. So the program started in MIT. Uh, it was an EO program that I took 20 or so years ago. It was called okay. Gathering of Giants, led by Vern Harnish, the founder yeah. of EO. Yeah. And my generation, I, gen I graduated 2003. And then with the generation of 2004, we got together and built like a, a continuation called Gathering of Titans. And the Gathering of Titans is built by us, all students, let's say all entrepreneurs. And we kind of uh, help <laughs> each other and we build it together. And we've been meeting for 18 years in a row, uh, going back to MIT, except last year because of COVID. It was the first year we broke it because of COVID. We've had a couple of Zoom things, but we haven't met there. So every year, 70 entrepreneurs, we get together um, in this uh, uh, place in MIT. And it's interesting. So when we started, it was all about money and how much money I made. And, but we've been at it 20 years. A lot of us are already in a more comfortable place. We kind of already got our demons out. We've proven ourselves in many ways and all that. And it's interesting how the conversation is being changing. So the speakers, the first year was all about growth and making money. And, and then this I kind of begin moving around. And today it's all about meditation, about how to guide our kids better. Like it's, it's just completely different. We're in a different stage in our life. Um, and in our businesses are usually in a different stage. We're not in a business that is surviving and, and you're not having cash to pay payroll and all these kind of issues. And you get to a certain point that there's less drama. You're more philosophical the way you see things. And life is different. But interestingly, let me just finish with this. Yeah. Every year, mm -hmm. there's one that just got divorced. There's one having a really big family challenge with someone around the family. Someone just sold the business for millions of dollars and it's just going crazy. And like, just life goes around. But if, if you see the average, the yeah. transition is being dramatical from the beginning to today can i uh yeah i try to introduce the concept of meditation post-awakening thought 
pre-sleep thought, focus on the mind yeah. to people. Most people don't understand that life is about life, not about things to do. And, and aspiration is a great thing. It should never be discounted. We should all aspire. I still aspire. Help, I aspire. I want to write this book. I want to finish this book. I want to learn more. I want to, you know, I, I, that keeps me excited. At the same time, it's about life. It's about, am I a good man for my wife? Am I thinking clearly? Am I finding out my capacity? Am I achieving all of that? Now, this is heavy. So you gave me permission to go here, so I will. Um, we have a will to live. Now, that's not a con preconscious uh, cerebral thought. It's innate. So if I said stop breathing, you couldn't do it. You can hold your breath, but you can't stop okay. breathing. It's not possible. So we have this will to live. Which all human beings and animals. Uh, huh? Even all animals have a oh. huge will to live. That's what, that's exactly, which drives fear. Uh, but we also have a fear of death. Uh, one of the books behind me somewhere, I don't know where, um, or I do know where, um, a man who was dying talked about the fear of death. Actually won a Pulitzer Prize, I believe, and never saw the book published because he was dying and it was published before he died. But the bottom line is that and anybody wants that title, I'll put it on the website, just call me or text me or email me. But the, the thing is that there are things that trigger a fear of death, end of relationship, moving, okay, big deal. Um, and actually the fear of death itself, which I faced at 18 years old for two years because I was diagnosed with an incurable cancer. But if we keep our aspiration in some sense of hope and use our will, then we find out our gradations of what we choose as success. Money, you know, you and I talk, okay, okay, the guy made millions, sold his business. We talk like that's everyday talk. It's not everyday talk to most people. But it's all ends up about life. And what are you capable of? And how do you move forward is critical in being able to move forward. You have to understand everything's a choice. But you have to understand that your mind drives those choices. And so when did you understand? I got two questions. When did you understand that your mind wanted to aspire about learning about yourself? And then we're going to talk about your brother. So, um, I was a terrible student, uh, high school, college, <laughs> everything. I was like terrible. Um, I just I, but, the but my father, my father has a PhD in economics from Notre Dame. So for him having a son with no degree was like, so so the, the joke in my house was be the boyfriend of the most intelligent girl in the room, um, copy, uh, whatever, even study, but get your degree. <laughs> that, that, that was the rule in my house. So I really didn't care and I passed just to have a degree and have my father happy. Um, but when I started my company, I realized I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> like, if, if you want to face a big challenge, uh, we, we got really lucky when we started. Uh, three months into my company, I had 80 employees. We raised $50 million, and I was 26. Oh! Um, and if, that, that was a, that was a challenge. Humbling as hell, because it doesn't say that. Yeah, it, that, that was, so we built the first fintech in Mexico. Uh, we were the first one to put stock quotes and news 
in the of the Mexican market in 1999, 1998. Yeah, I was, uh, was. And when you had a dot com last name, people just threw money at you. Um, oh, sure. So, so we built the, the biggest, uh, the second biggest internet company in Latin America. 1,200 employees raised 70 million dollars. Blah blah blah. So, but I was 26, and the guy who acquired me was 24. And we had no idea. And we were cocky kids. We were internet, blah, blah, blah. And once you raise money, now you start having to give results to adults that gave you a lot of money. And things change. Uh, and you have to start figuring things out. And, and you grow really, really fast. So I realized how little I knew about life and business and stuff. And I had to push myself. And, and I that's when I got in love with reading and, and, and books and all these kind of things. And I just went into a rabbit hole about learning. Um, um, so that was the first time I really got confronted with learning. Um, that for me, it was in a in a in a very childish way. Learning, I think it's the first time you actually committed to learning. Yes. Okay. So we, after you we raised all this money, we had to be yeah we put all these valuation whatever, and once they wire the money. Then you say like, oh God, like I need to give a return to this money. <laughs> like, like we're now playing serious things. And that's when things change and, and we really got excited about learning and doing things. Yeah. So, so that, that was a big change in, in, my, in my life, in, in my seriousness, in how I saw things. And I got in love with learning uh, when that happened. <coughs> so <coughs> the... Um... Thanks everybody for their patience with that. We all get a dry throat sometimes. Uh, the, there are transitions in life. So when I was a younger man, I realized if I'm gonna help people with transitions, I have to understand them better and go through them faster than other people or I'm a hypocrite if I help them. And you just described that probably better than anybody I talked about. I, I can't wait till this video is on the website because that, that was strong. So there has to be desire. Hold on one second. I have some notes I wrote last night. And <laughs> my producer would be pissed. I had to get up. But I've got 90 all the rules. <laughs> I have a 95 year old psychoanalyst that's dying. I just visited in Washington, D.C. Mind is brilliant. Uh, he's written 35 or 40 books now. A doer doing, he said, I, I, the process is intention, action, completion, and satisfaction. So I don't care if you want to take the garbage out. You have an intention to take it out. If you're interrupted, it bothers your mind. For some people, yeah. intentional people. You want to complete the task, and then you feel a satisfaction that you were a doer that did something and completed the task. And some of us don't know. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find a way not to be look like you have a light. Oh, yeah. Um, some people don't know how to find their path. And the motivation of your responsibility to another human being is quite honorable. You, you actually said, I'm not gonna be my dad. So that was an authoritative disregard. Not to your father as a human being, just to, I don't, I, I don't wanna do that, I'm bigger than that. And then you had to find the bigger than that, which you did brilliantly. And, and honorably and respectfully you look, can look back and say a dot com that made you money and uh, you had to offer some value you're just being humble you're a humble man and we uh, returned 500 percent the money and now you're sitting at a plastic table you've <laughs> done well my friend <laughs> sorry i had to take the shot that was just too funny i had to go there <laughs> thank you for that you're probably going here like a multi-million dollar. Nah, I just had to see it. All right. So 
so, uh, so here's, here's the Costco plastic table. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Oh, God. Thanks for sharing that. That made it even more authentic. <laughs> One of the things that people like about conversations with Joe is they're real. This is kind of how I talk to my clients every week. It's, I mean, it's exactly the conversation we have. And it, it can be about anything. But the point is, it's about the mind. How is our mind helping us? How does it limit us? And when do we examine the unexamined in our mind? So, uh, for example, and forgive me, I'm going along. Uh, most people would say, this is my religion. I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Hindu. But they didn't pick it, they inherited it. Life is different. You pick your life. And you pick yours. You should. Eh, exceptional people pick their life. Those are the people you work with and the people I yeah. work with. Yeah. So I know your brother died died early he died at uh and you gave me permission to say this you uh, thank you I, I just want people to know he died at 49 years old you were very close and you're 49 years old it's going through your mind so when i woke up my wife said congratulations 49 and i said that's exactly the age my brother passed that was the first thing i said that morning of course, of course. Uh, how do you process that? So he's the closest person I lost. So I love my grandfather and my grandmother. And when they passed, but they were a hundred years and 95. So it, it was it was the right time and, and they had a great life. I hope you have their genes. Um, me too. Um, uh, he did my I grandfather go to- can. I, I'm not sure I can say that. No, we don't want to see. <laughs> no. <laughs> so my grandfather got to one oh, almost 101, and he went to the office until he was like 95, 96. And we used to tell him, hey, Grandpa, it's cold outside. Don't go to, to the office. And he said, you want me to die? And I was like, no, of course not. Then let me go to a job. Job scares death away. So let me go to, to my office. And he went every day. <laughs> and by the way, it took him two hours to get dressed, like half hour to get there. He stayed in the office probably 15, 20 minutes. He got tired and came back. But he every day put a suit and everything. So, uh, and my brother was way thinner than me. Uh, as I told you, he did a four hour mountain bike two days before. Yeah. Uh, indeed, he had this house in the mountain with dogs and all these kind of animals. And when he was mountain biking, his dogs went with him. The dogs couldn't, they, they were so tired, <laughs> they couldn't come back. <laughs> and my brother was in perfect shape. And one day he woke up, he had a heart failure and he passed. Um, it obligates you to see life in a very, very different way. Um, and think about your kids and your wife and, and your parents in a different way. My parents are both still alive in really good shape. They're both very strong and travel independent and everything. And they lost a child. So um, I, I really, really, really believe no parent should see a child go before that. Um, it's just wrong in life. It's wrong. When I was dying at 18 years old, I, my empathy was with my parents because you should, parents should never see a child die. It's, it's just not the right order. So, so you have a really... One of the things I really respect about you, like me, you have purposeful intent, which I'm writing about my new book, and this purposeful intent, which gives an authenticity to your life because we're all fakers. You know, God, we didn't put an owner's manual in our pockets because we were born naked. We didn't have clothes, so we didn't have pockets. So there's no owner manual. And you got to figure it out. And then you want to be what your mother wants you to be or your father wants you to be or your company wants you to be or uh, aspire to a million dollars. I had a client one time, not a client. Somebody called me, wanted to be a client. I didn't take it. 
uh, it said, I want to make a million dollars. I said, why only a million? And they didn't have a good answer. So uh, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? And how will you find your unique self in the process? That's the key. And I've dedicated my life to that since 18 years old. Not for others, for me. It just ended up a career. And now you're doing it with a great reward. And you told your father you're not going to go to school. And you're one of the smartest students. You and I both learn. We humble ourselves to our lessons. We don't pride ourselves to our lessons. And everyone's my teacher. I want everyone to be my teacher. Uh, and that's how I learn. I, I got to tell you, I really am uh, impressed by you in, in so many ways. I'm so glad you're on the show and you're helping people. Uh, you're a good man. Can, can we... I don't know if we have questions or not. I don't have access to knowing what the producer's getting, but do we have questions for our last few minutes together with Daniel? I hope we do. We had a Let me couple. Share one. Well, they look for a question. Um, so as you said, you were worried for your parents when you were sick, when you were 18. Um, so whenever you were saying we're afraid of dying, I, I'm afraid of dying, but more important because my parents, if, if they lose two kids, I think that'll be too much um, and too painful for them. And then for my kids and my wife, um, I was part of helping organize the state of my brother for his ex-wife and, and kids and, and all that. And like you, you really see things different and I have significantly changed the way I run my life because you never know. Right, I think my brother was the healthiest, and you never know. And and now you see it different. And and now my life is more about them being okay and and my parents being happy than me. Um, and, and for me, what what success means for me is that you accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. If if I want to accomplish, wake up at ten a.m. every day with no worries. And if I'm able to do that, I'm happy. And if I want to accomplish, make a million dollars. And again, I get that, I'm happy. Um, but the priorities change uh, uh, in life. Uh, for me today, it's all about my parents being happy. Now I became the older brother now. Um, so my parents are getting old. Now it's my responsibility a lot in many ways. And then uh, that my kids and my wife are, are comfortable and set. Um, and and it's, it's just a very, very different mindset uh, and space. And what we have to do in our lives, and that's brilliant, is understand ourselves at different levels as we enter different, we enter each age of life as a novice. I wrote book. Who am I now? And the answer is, if you found, I determined my goal to build my skills and my ability to the best of my abilities to help other people. And to, to live to things beyond yourself is critical to happiness. And that's been written through thousands of years. Michael, I'm sorry I interrupted you. We have questions. Thank you. So from our audience, they asked that uh, Daniel is intrigued with a lot and gets to meet a lot of entrepreneurs. And Joe has been quoted as being one of the top 50 brilliant minds. Who would you put in the same classification as Joe Caruso? Oh, that's a fair question. That's an assumptive question. Wow. Who are the brilliant minds in your life? Who are the brilliant minds in my life? Wow. Um, all right. Um, so the, the person that has impacted my life the most in business and all that is with Vern Harnish. Right, um, sure. Vern led the uh, burning of giants and really opened my eyes to a completely different world. Uh, so he's, he's been extremely influential. And today he's my business partner and we have a great uh, experience uh, growing the company together and all that. So I, he, 
he he it's really important. It's um, of course, my parents uh, have been instrumental in, in who I am and, and guide me through uh, life. And, and I, I, I am a lot of who I am because of them and the values and things. Um, other person that I've learned recently a lot, uh, Salim Ismail uh, from Singularity University, uh, brilliant mind. Uh, indeed, the best presentation I've got with Salim. He teach a class called Meaning of Life. Um, so in Singularity, when you used to go to the executive program, every day by this third or fourth day, people are kind of depressed because all this technology and all that, and they begin questioning their life. So Salim said, hey, let's meet in one of the classrooms, seven or eight o'clock at night, bring drinks, and we're going to stay there until we finish agreeing what, what's the meaning of life. That, and we usually come out at 3 or 4 a.m. Exactly the way to do it. Amazing. It's it's the best class I've ever taken. <laughs> so, so, so I will put Salim up there. Greek, where they walk around and just talk. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, people people are we're seeing technology and talking with scientists all day. And by the third day, most of the people are depressed because we're seeing all the technology and all the world moving so fast. And Salim begins seeing that and said, we need to get them to talk about life. And now he gave us, now he has his lecture around the meaning of life. And everyone comes the next day kind of tired because we're until three o'clock in the morning getting drink, but really, really having a lot of fun. Uh, you know, 2000 years ago, they took science and they put it in boxes. Aristotle was part of this. I love Aristotle, but part of the problem is history, science, biology. And we put everything in boxes and then we put them in schools and we taught them in classes instead of saying life. Life. There's a, a, a book I have by a professor called The Path. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, the Path. I should show it yeah. that way. And, so, and you know, the guy's most popular professor in the, cow, in the university and because the kids aren't thinking about a subject, they're thinking about life. And that's what you do for entrepreneurs. You say, yeah, okay, so we can create a business, organizational structure, meeting rhythms, uh, you know, all the stuff you guys teach. Uh, and you'll make millions and then you'll sell it and every, you'll just be another rich guy or a woman. That's America. We live in the I mean, it's a wealthy society. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? So what child will you wish for? Because usually dreams come true. And <laughs> you wish for all these material things and stuff, and then you get them. And so the other day I was taking a lecture with someone that presented in the audience. And the guy said, I'm, I'm a coach to billionaires. Not a presumptuous guy, but fine. But guy, he, he gave a pretty good talk. And then at the end, I, he stayed for dinner and all that. So I came to him and said, hey, so who have you coached? And he said, well, I cannot give you names, but out of the list of the 400, I've coached like six or seven. And I'm like, okay, you're coach on billionaires. And I said, what's your big issue? Like, why they hire you? And he said many things, but he said one of the main ones is whenever they went all the way up and they're up there, they have no idea who are their real friends. They don't know who they bought in the process of going up and who's there to be the real friend. So we spend a lot of time talking about what's real friendship and, and, and how to really understand who's the right friend and who's not. Because they know they bought a lot of people and a lot of friendships going up. Um, and based on their position, it's very, very hard to really realize who's real and who's not. 100% true. Well, Daniel, I, we have to sign off on, only because of time. I, I'm not happy about that because I, I can talk. Get, so one more plug in. Daniel's book is just coming out as well. Oh. On the fall. Yes. I want to hear about this. Uh, uh, my book's called Impact X and how the best leaders do 10 times the impact with half the drama. I'm really putting together... Um, a kind of a, a format of how to scale a company depending on the stage. Uh, I get a lot of entrepreneurs and I got this text this morning like, what should I do? And I was like, he's like going to the doctor and said, doctor, I'm sick or I have a pain. 
give me the most important medicine or the toughest medicine. Like, for what? There's thousands of medicines, right? So I'm trying to kind of give a path of how companies grow in stages and what are the real pains in each stage and figure out what you have to do on each stage to take it to the next level. So that's, that's uh, indeed, uh, it's gone uh, to my second editor in two weeks. So we should publish it in September, October next, this year. Uh, how do we get it? Uh, it's going to be in Amazon, but it's still not published yet. So it's going to be September, October. Uh, Impact X is going to be called the name of the book. Um, and if you're subscribing all my database or whatever, in all my social media, I'm going to be making a big noise around it. So Daniel, uh, I'm going to ask up front, do you mind if we do another conversation with Joe Caruso in September oh, and put a panel together and have all of you guys together? No, I would love it. I really, really appreciate that. Thank That's you. Good idea, Mark. Well, okay. right when you launch your book, Joe will be coming out with his book. Uh, and I think that people on a panel and asking them about what the importance of their, their new books would be great. Perfect. We'll do a book lunch party. <laughs> A mutual admiration society. Oh, wait, I don't have anything to flip. I know we've run over a little bit. And I do want to thank Daniel and Marcos for, for tune, tuning in. And as always, Joe, you've been a great host. Uh, we do have two upcoming conversations with Joe Caruso with Ziz Abdul Raouf. Ziz is a former NFL wide receiver with Kansas City Chiefs. And Lee Weintraub, Lee Weintraub, who is a coach out and has been an All-American athlete in the college ranks and has been talking and working with lots of groups. So we're excited to have them in May. Daniel, thank you again. And Joe, as always, until next time. Joe, Michael, thank you very much for the invitation. I had a great time. Thank Thanks you. for joining the conversation with Joe. I can't wait to talk to you more. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.